All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 1883 Speaker Series. My name is Mike Wozniak. I serve as the Coordinator of Leadership and Programming in the Student Involvement and Parent Programs Office. Each week, we invite a campus or community leader to talk about how today's student can develop their leadership skills, as well as other advice regarding personal and professional development. We hope you learn some valuable lessons in the next 18 minutes and 83 seconds. For today's speaker, please join me in welcoming UND's Associate Director of Bands and the Director of the Pride of the North Bands, Rob Brooks. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming today. I appreciate seeing so many friendly faces out there. My name is Rob Brooks. I am uh, the director of the Pride of the North Bands. I've been, uh, this is my 26th year here, uh, and about my 30th year plus of teaching. And I've been fortunate enough over that time to having led and taught over, well, thousands of students, a couple thousand, and uh, interacting with tens of thousands of people during that time. And I'm very honored to speak today about uh, leadership. It's something that I, I pretend that I know a little bit about, and, uh, and, and hopefully you can glean a little bit about what I've learned over the years. Uh, leadership to me, it's where it starts. My first, uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm from Oklahoma, a little town in Oklahoma. It's near the Panhandle. The easiest way to describe it is it's by the arm. It's in the armpit of Oklahoma. And it's uh, Woodward, Oklahoma. It, it's not a reflection of its character. It's a great little town, great people. It's a great place to grow up and live. Lived out of town, uh, lived out in the country, and I had a horse. One day I was uh, riding my horse. I was about 11 years old. Riding my horse. I'm a full gallop, and my Irish setter is falling up behind, and uh, it spooked my horse, and it made the horse buck a little bit. Anyway, I fell off, and I landed on a rock right there, and it split my arm in two. So for anybody that's ever had a broken arm, I don't know if you've ever had this, but they don't set that in a cast. They tape it to your body, right? So here I am, a little 11-year-old kid. got his arm taped to his body. I go to school the next day. I've been wearing my Broncos jersey. I walk in the door, and the teacher looks at me and says, Rubber, take your arm out of that shirt. Now, she had good reason to say that because I may have been the class clown a little bit. I may have won some awards for being class clown. Anyway, so she had good reason to say that. So I had to go, Miss Harris is, you know, I broke my arm. It's taped to I can't even. Okay, then go, go sit down and don't cause any problems. All right, so I did that. Jump ahead, the leader or the uh, teacher left the room and uh, she was gone a few minutes and the students came over and started, I said, well, what happened to your arm? And it's like, well, I broke and they wanted to see him. Jump a few minutes ahead uh, later after that, the teacher comes back in the room and I am leading a conga line of students chanting something that I can't repeat here because I'm not sure the statute of limitations are, are expired on SWATs I could get from this. But anyway, we're chanting and she comes in and she had every right to yank me out of that room and march me straight to the principal's office. But instead, she started laughing. And it was that moment that I knew that I could influence an outcome. And it's not until later on that I understood that, but I knew I had the talent to influence some people. And that's really where it begins. For, for you, it begins at a different spot, obviously, probably. But for me, that's where it was. So whenever you're presenting, you have types of influence that you can do, right? And there's hundreds of types of influence. These are the, my, my go-tos that I go to. And the students who are here in the uh, audience will recognize probably each one of these types, and I'll go through each one of them. So let's start with a reaction reader. You've been in a situation where you're sitting with an advisor, or a teacher, or or, you know, authority figure of some kind, and you're sitting there, and they're reading, and, and you're giving them uh, sadness, and then you see sadness on their face, and then you see excitement, and then you're there excited, and then you, you cross your arms, and then they cross their arms. Well, they're mirroring you, and at some point during that conversation, something's going to happen, and then you're going to start following them. You won't even know it, but you will, and I and it's very effective simply because they can lead you in a direction that way. And it's a very subtle thing that, uh, that people do and that I do that really gets you to connect with them. Another one that I do that you'll probably recognize or the, the students will probably recognize is the wave starter. Let's go with that one. So wave starter, uh, implied from the name wave starter. Ooh. Ah. Ooh, and then he 
you start the wave, right? So this is my version of the wave starter. Hey, hey, thanks so much for being here. Hey, you guys look awesome. Can you do something for me? Can everybody stand up? Go ahead and stand up. Yep, go ahead, stand up. We need to stretch a little bit anyway. We've been sitting too long, five minutes. We need to get some exercise. There we go. Hey, now can I get you, go ahead and just turn a circle, a 360 circle. Just turn to the right, circle, excellent. Oh, very good, very good. Next thing I like to do, we need to stretch our legs a little bit. Can you lift your left leg just a little bit? Yes, that's excellent. Put it down. We're gonna try that one more time. You're gonna lift it a little bit higher and then you're gonna stick your left foot out, okay? Lift it up, put your left foot out. Now put it left, put it to the left, put it to the right, stretch it as far as you can. Now left, right, put it left, right. Okay, sit it down. You can sit down. You just learned the hokey pokey, by the way. So that's the wave starter. The plane talker, I, I do this at rehearsals quite a bit. Hey gang, all right. So I got something to tell you. I, I can't hardly believe it myself, but they came up to me before this presentation and they said, because you guys are here, one of the requirements is we have to clean every bathroom in this place. I couldn't believe it. And they said we had to do it with toothbrushes. And they said the last group, the last time this happened, it took them three hours. I, I'm sorry, I, it's I, nothing I could do about it. But you know, if we work together, I believe in you. We work as a team, we can do this. And each one of us takes 10 people to that bathroom. We start and we scrub, we scrub, we scrub. We can do it. Can we do it? All right, here we go. Now, now you want to scrub a bathroom, right? No, <laughs> no, I really don't. And one of my favorites that I, I always do that everybody gets a kick out of is the coach. And everybody knows the coach, uh, coach from whatever sport you've been in, but this is my version of the coach. And obviously it's a little over the top, but it's like this. Hey gang, thanks for coming today. All right, come on, take a knee. All right, now listen up. We've got a problem today. See our water trough over there? It's filled with 100 gallons of water. Now we've been using that, drinking out of it for about two weeks. It's starting to turn a little rancid. So what we gotta do is move that water tank over there, to over there where we can fill it again. All right, so what you're gonna do is, everybody's gonna get around, we're gonna throw our head down the water and just start gulping that water. Gulp it up, gulp it up. And pretty soon, we're just gonna be loud enough we can move it over here. Okay, so that's the coach. It's, it's a little ridiculous, but you get the idea. The uh, one that uh, I, I truly enjoy doing is the hard sell. The hard sell encompasses all of these influential tactics. And uh, the best example of the hard sell I've ever seen happened a couple of years ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and I, we won a uh, trip to Branson, Missouri. And part of the winning is that we had to sit and listen to a timeshare presentation. And if you've ever been to a timeshare presentation, you know that these people are professionals. So, and I, I was really excited about this because, yeah, I mean, watching a true professional in action and anything they do is, is outstanding. But, so we go in this room, we have 20 people and he starts at it. He gives us the coach, he gives us the wave star, he gives us the plane talker, and then he starts mirroring our reactions of what, by the end of that meeting, you know, you can go in thinking, I ain't buying anything, but at the end of that meeting, it's like, how can I not buy this? And it's amazing, so I encourage you, don't buy anything at a timeshare, but appreciate the professionalism that they, they employ during all of that. So being a leader is, or once you decide that you want to be a leader, you have to decide really who you are or understand who you are. And what I mean by that is some people want to be managers with the idea of being leaders, but know that all leaders are managers, but not all managers are leaders. What I mean by that is, well, you can see by the descriptions on the screen, managers administrate, they make sure you fill the quotas, they make sure you make the fries, so to speak, right? So they have very short-term goals. They look at things in days, weeks, months, instead of what leaders do, look long-term, years two years, five years, 10 years. Managers work within a system. You know, administrators, whoever it is, they work within the system before you. So we have 
10 hours in this week that we've got to fill and we've got to do this by the end of this week and I need these people to do this. Innovators don't think that way. They think in a different way, not they outside of the box. They create, they inspire, they influence. And it's more about not conforming to the status quo, but creating a new quo, right? So understanding the difference between the two is important. The types of leaders, now there's a million books written on leadership. Some say there's uh, 11 types of leadership. Uh, I, I believe there's only two. You know, some can argue that laissez-faire should be in there, but that's more of a manager thing. Anyway, the two, two that I, I recognize is leading by example and leading by dictate. And we can understand easily these two terms. A lot of times in marching band, I lead by example. I'm not going to ask them to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. I can show them how to do it. I can show them how to march. I can show them this. I can show them that. I can show them how to dig a ditch. You know, that's a leading by example. Leading by dictate, we all do as well, and I do as well, but there's a little bit different style to it. Leading by dictate means that you can't show everybody what to do. You just have a vision that you lay out before them and then try to get them to that path. And I do that as well, but uh, any type of uh, elected person, you'll understand that they lead by dictate mostly anyway. They're not going to lead by experience just because they can't make that connection with everybody. But there's one thing that all leaders have that not all managers have, and definitely not all people have, is grit. What do I mean by grit? Well, grit means determination, heart, willingness. Best example of grit I can, I can tell you about uh, is my dad. My dad was, uh, well, he was born in 1923 in Oklahoma to a family of 10. He was the youngest. They were short sharecroppers, very poor. And by the time he could walk, he was out cutting broom corn. By the time I came around, he was a monster of a man. I mean, just huge. Just, yeah, he was 6'4", 300 pounds. His arms were big as tree trunks, and his hands were like baseball gloves. I mean, they're twice as big as mine. When I was about eight years old, I noticed on his hand, on his left hand, that up to the knuckle, this finger was normal, but then the knuckle up to the tip was smaller. It's about the size of my finger right there. And I asked him, well, Dad, what's up with it? What, what happened to your hand? And he said, well, I'll tell you, boy. One day we were out cutting wood. We were using our chains. And my finger got caught in that chain. And it got ripped off. And it was just hanging there by the skin. I said, well, what would you do? He said, well, I went in the house. Mom said, sit down. She p washed it up, poured some whiskey on it set it on there and proceeded to sew it back on with needle and thread. Yeah. So it, I said, well, did you go to the hospital? Did you? Well, still on there, so I guess it's all right. And that was his view of things. It's not necessarily an example of, of his grit, but it's an example of the way he looked at life. That was just a day in his life. And yes, it was a tough day, but it was a day he got through. And that's the voice I hear in my head whenever I have a tough day. Because I never saw him. He, was, he created businesses, and he, was a, he had a trucking business. He had an oil company and, and uh, was successful at many different things. And he led by example. But I never saw him. I never heard him say, I'm, I can't do it today. That's just, I, can't, I don't have it in me. No, he had it laid out before him. And every time I saw him, it was just, well, you got to do it. So that's the voice I hear in my head. And when I don't want to do something, I hear, boy, get up and do it. So that's an example of grit that leaders possess. They're going to get the job done. They're going to push forward. They're going to bring you along with them. And that's what the difference is between a lot of managers and true leaders. Also, another difference between managers and leaders is understanding the weight. The weight of leadership. Weight of leadership is knowing 
who you're trying to lead. Yeah. 29,200. Does anybody know what this number means, denotes? Everybody's life expectancy is about 80 years. It's really about 79, 79 for women, 71 for men. Well, we'll say 80 for right now. That's 29,200 days. That's all you get. The phrase time is money, right? So I want to have you look at it a little bit different way. I want you to think of each one of those days as a dollar. You've got three stacks of dollars. If you're 25, by the time you leave this place, one of those stacks is gone. And each day, you take a dollar off, and you have to spend it. That's all you get. Some people are asked to turn in their dollars way early. But you hope that you get to take each one of those dollars, right? And spend it. And what you spend it on is up to you. Say you break that dollar down, you got 30 cents, you put it in that first class. You're gonna sleep eight hours. That's what you're gonna do with your day. You're gonna rest, relax, sleep. Then you're gonna take 20 cents in that next class and you're gonna put it in there and you're gonna eat. You're gonna take care of yourself. Some people put 25 and say it doesn't take it takes a little bit more to do this hair, you know, whatever it is. Say the rest of the day they got 50 cents left to spend. So I look at whenever I'm in front of people or I'm demanding of people's time, I look at it as like this. They have 50 cents to spend. Say it's a rehearsal day. I got 10 cents of that day. What do they get out of that day? I'm not paying them to be there. Extrin extrinsic value is not anything that they can keep. It's nothing that they can put in that final glass. It's only what they can take from the rehearsal, well, the things that they experience, the people that they influence, the people that they can move. And that's what I hope whenever I'm in front of students that each day I can have them put something in that last class. And then at the end of their day, they can put it in their bucket at the end of their lives that they have a bucket of experiences that they can look back on because that's all we have interactions with people experiences that we do things that we things that we accomplish all intrinsic and that's all we have so it's the weight of leadership the weight of knowing that these people are giving up something valuable to you it's not just oh they can go do this and that's why i'm protective of of the pride's time because Everybody is like, hey, come play for this, come play for this. Says, well, what do the students get out of it? I'm not talking money. What is it for them? What, can I, what do they take from it? Every year we start a uh, pride meeting, and I, and I tell them, I'm going to make you work. Some days you're going to hate me, but you're going to hopefully have, at the end of it, experiences that you can look back on, take with you the rest of your life. And that leads me to the final thought, the secret. The secret of leadership. The secret of leadership is understanding that it's not about you. And it's not about any title you can have, how much money you have. It's about the people that you are fortunate enough to lead and how much you can fill their glass. Thanks so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Rob. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, join us next week for our final speaker of the fall semester, uh, the CEO of the UND Alumni Association and Foundation, Deanna Carlson-Zink. Uh, have a great rest of your week.